Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Pamela Io Yatende, and she's here to share with us her new book, Casting Indra's Net, Fostering Spiritual Kinship and Community. So Pamela Io Yatende is a community Dharma leader in the insight meditation tradition. She teaches pastoral care and counseling and has taught at the University of the West United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities and Upaya Institute and Zen Center. She has written for Buddha Dharma, Lion's Roar, Religion, and Buddhist Christian Studies. So let's welcome to the show, Pamela Ayoyutende. Thank you, Marianne. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this new book. So what inspired you to write this? Oh, so many things have inspired me. First, I want to just express gratitude to you for having me on your on your podcast. I, uh, I'm a lover of wisdom. I'll start there. When I hear something that I think is really wise, I embrace it. I try to incorporate it and live by it. And as someone who has worked as a chaplain in public settings, as a pastoral counselor in private practice, I know that people are supported uh, by wisdom, uh, whether the wisdom comes from their uh, their tradition of birth, if you will, or something they converted to, or it's a worldview or a set of ethics. They are comforted by that and led by that. And we live in the United States in a very diverse uh, country. And I thought it would be wonderful at this time of, of great division and divisiveness to pull together some of the greatest wisdom stories from our traditions so that we could be reminded that the wisdom is there for our taking and our living, and that many of our, if not all of the major world traditions, also offer wisdom that we can partake of. Well, I agree with you on that. There's so much to be had there, and everything offers a nugget of wisdom, if not more. And so it's, I think it was so impactful to read your book. And so you talk about Indra's net, this casting Indra's net. What's the symbolism of that? The symbolism of that is that we're all interconnected. Indra's net comes out of an ancient Indian, Hindu, Vedic tradition uh, based on the concept of Indra, the god Indra, creating a world where everyone is connected. However, (laughs) uh, in that connection, in that net, Indra was able to capture Indra's foes and punish punish them in a way that they they weren't able to escape from the net. So fast forward thousands of years now, Indra's net actually means that we are interconnected and also through our interconnection, we can illuminate one another's goodness. Each one of us is a node or a jewel, a pearl, if you will, in the net, imbued with with basic goodness, with the ability to reflect another's goodness. And this is how we can coexist with more harmony by recognizing our interconnectedness. That's such a big deal right now. I think so many people, especially now, feel like they're pretty disconnected from one another. Yes. Yes. Loneliness is an epidemic. And this isolation and alienation from one another is used politically to drive even deeper and wider wedges between us. So I just want to do my part, my little bitty part to help bring us together. Well, I'm so glad that you wrote this book. It's such a great read. Thank you. Yes. And then as we, you know, you go through your book, the one that really kind of stuck out to me, and I'm sure you probably get this often, is Beyond the Golden Rule. Oh, boy. I would love for you to share that. (laughs) <laughs> or the golden rule, right? The golden rule is something that we've been taught from, from our earliest days on this planet about how to treat each other, to first begin thinking about what we would want, how we would want to be treated, and then treating someone else the very same way we want to be treated. But I don't think that's working anymore. I think we need to become more sophisticated 
about human nature, uh, more curious about others, and begin to shift our attention towards the needs of others before we start with our self-template. Everyone need not be treated the way we want to be treated, right? So that's basically what I'm saying. We need to go beyond the self-template of the golden rule and adopt what I'm calling the platinum rule, which is to think of others first. Be curious about them first. Learn to be I don't know, confident and skilled that we might be able to meet their needs as they see their needs are. And then we can free ourselves from the delusion that everyone should be treated the way we want to be treated. Is it really kind of rising above what other people may, how they may treat us or how they may not treat us, but holding a certain standard? Well, I, th- I think the the standard that I see is what we're trying to do, maybe the aspiration or the objective is to treat people the way they need to be treated for their ultimate well-being. And what that means is not always being pleasing, right? People often say, if you love me, you'll give me what I want. (laughs) And always getting what we want is not the best for us. Sometimes we need to be told the truth. Sometimes we need to be withheld. Uh, Certain things need to be withheld from us. Uh, We learned this early when we are uh, raising children in particular. It's not good to always give people what they want. So if we think of their ultimate well-being, and by that I mean their ability to thrive in this society, their ability to cultivate confidence, their ability to become loving, and compassionate, if we have that in mind, then maybe we can say, how can I support this person so that they can become those things? Because it's their resilience that will help them thrive. And I want to support their resilience. In many ways, I've heard people say for their highest and best good. So we kind of separate ourselves from uh, maybe being the doormat or being uh, the people pleaser. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. I don't think there's any value in being the door doormat perpetually. But sometimes we do sacrifice ourselves. Sometimes we do lay ourselves down for the well-being of another. Uh, if we think we can pick ourselves up again, dust ourselves off and move on and let that person know that that's not going to be a habit. <laughs> you know, we may we did that. We laid ourselves down. We sacrificed ourselves for one time. But that is not to be expected the next time. No, no, I get that. I get that. When, I mean, you have such great experience and just education. When you're writing this book, did you have like a vision of the kind of person you wanted to be? Yes. It is the person who loves others unconditionally the kind of person who is not deluded by image, appearance, sound, political opinion, that I can remember the essence of who we are and not be dissuaded by differing opinions. Even when someone is, let's say, geared towards violence towards me, that I can remember that this person is not always like this. That's the kind of person I'm striving to be. Well, you definitely embody that. And I know probably some people are going, well, wait a minute. Look, you know, she'd have a a vision for the person she wants to be when she's really that already. Oh, no, you know, (laughs) the, the, we change, right? That's, that's one thing I've learned about being a human being. We change. Our responses change depending on how we perceive situations. Our, the laws of perception change depending on our surroundings. So when I say that I'm striving to be this kind of person, I mean all the time in all situations. And I have not met every human situation. So I don't know if I can't, if my aspiration will rise in every situation, but that's what I want for myself. 
I think it's good just to hear about that it's a continuation of practice, a daily practice. Yes. Well, you have so much great information in your book. What are some of the universal truths that you'd like to share with us? I think the main one is that we are all worthy of love. That's one. Two, I guess I would say we all need love. Three, the earlier we receive it, the better for the person and for everyone around them. And I learned that through adopting my child. She has given me permission to talk about her life. So I can just say briefly that she moved in with us, my partner and I, when she was six and a half years old. Um, and she had been severely neglected and uh, abused in different ways, abandoned by three adults, separated from her siblings. And she's had a hard road developmentally because of this. So the earlier we can receive adequate love and nurturance, the better. And even if we received it, we still need it. So those those are some truths that I want to share. Well, you know, just bless your heart for doing that because my goodness, what a kind and gentle heart it takes to adopt a child. And that's something not a lot of people think about. Mm. Well, you know, if you don't mind my saying, this is this is what I want for myself and I want to invite other people to think about. One of the reasons why I wrote this book is because I want us to go beyond uh, conventional notions of friendship towards more radical notions of family. And th- the way to get through that is using our imagination and adopting one another just in our imagination. Like, Marianne, I've never met you, right? We're having a conversation for the first time. In my imagination, I am choosing to adopt you as my sibling. And some people say, oh, you know, that's just too much. That's over the top or, you know, families aren't perfect. Right. We are not perfect. Individuals aren't perfect. Families aren't perfect. But if I can lean towards you as Ken, I think, and you do the same for me, I think in this time of divisiveness where we are being asked really to turn against one another, there's a greater chance that I won't do that if I already see you as my sibling and you see me as yours. What a beautiful practice that is. I just love that. I'm going to incorporate that within my day. And I I think it's just such a powerful thing to look at as we shift perspectives and how we view the people around us. And we can do it. You know, people say, how can you do that? Like we actually, we do this all the time. We adopt four-legged species. We adopt reptiles. (laughs) We can certainly adopt each other, uh, human being to human being, because we have practice doing it. Well, I don't know about the reptiles, but with the four-legged ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there that love that. Mm-hmm. There are. <laughs> Is there a story that you would like to share with us? Well, I, the story that I want to share is the story of Anel, not this person's real name, and I don't want to identify their gender either. I think about Tanel and I think about how I met Tanel and what Tanel wanted from me. Uh, I was working as a pastoral counselor in a mental health care organization, and Tanel had uh, tried several times to hurt themselves, severely hurt themselves. They were a Christian who was attending a church, uh, and many of the church members told Tanel that they did not need to be in a, health, a mental health care organization. All they needed to do was pray more. And they had a weekly ritual of laying hands on Tanel, but Tanel was not getting better. So Tanel asked me if I would come to the church 
and explain what their mental health condition was, what the treatment for it was, and why prayer alone would not be sufficient. So I accepted that invitation. I spoke at the church. I used the book of Job to talk about the suffering of humanity and what Job was healed from and what he was not healed from, what the story left wide open at the end and why it was important for people to read the the story in its entirety. So after my presentation, I I could see that people were disturbed by what I was saying. Um, (laughs) The pastor called me the following day and said, I just want to let you know, you know, thank you very much for coming. I reiterated and agreed with everything you said. And also, we cannot have you back at this church. And I said, I understand. And I did. I anticipated that. The reason why I'm sharing that story with you right now is to say that we need going back to the platinum rule. We need to go beyond treating people the way we want to be treated and increase our sophistication around healing that actually works and support a person's healing path when it has been shown that it works so that we don't get in the way of their healing. The platinum rule might also include, I will not get in the way of another person's healing process. I will support it 100%. What a powerful story. And you are so brave to do that. I think a lot of people may have uh, really kind of given that a second thought, especially when you're speaking in front of a group of a very large group of people. But it sounds like that point was very important to make. I think it was important to make because this person's life was on the line. Well, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you. In your book, you talk about action without attachment. So why is it important that we do action and not be attached to the mm-hmm. outcomes or things or what have you? I'm really glad you asked that question because it's probably one of the hardest lessons I've learned in my life. As a young activist, I think I was under the impression, I'm pretty sure I was under the impression that uh, that you 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 just go at something. Uh, social change. You go at it, you go at it, you go at it until you have achieved your goal. And are these goals ever permanently achieved? They are not. But we don't know that as a young person, right? So we have victories. uh, We have temporary victories. And so the combination of learning about impermanence, about suffering, about the ego, about the suffering that comes from clinging and craving to a particular outcome of which we have no control over because other people are involved in and other people with opposite views. So we don't control them. But we can now, with that wisdom and those practices of letting go, show up as witnesses, tell our truth, hopefully have an impact on a person or on a situation or a system. But when we do that with the necessity for a particular outcome and the persistence and determination to make sure that outcome occurs, we run the risk of using aggression against others. And that causes suffering for everybody. So, I just, I recommend that we just show up, do the best we can, keeping others in mind, their well being in mind, mind, keeping the platinum rule in mind. And also, it's important to prepare the next generation to continue uh, the cause because eventually our, our, our energy will run low. And as someone who has burned out in the past, I highly recommend that we pay attention to our energy level so we don't burn out, so we don't turn to aggression in our frustration, and we and we proceed with wisdom, knowing that our victories are temporary. I just love that. 
I think that's so important. And it's interesting how many people, I mean, we talked about this a little earlier, but just how many people feel so disconnected. And I love how your mm-hmm. subtitle is fostering spiritual kinship and community. And it seems like that's probably a part that our society has been missing in many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, th- this may surprise some people, but you re- do you remember Billy Graham? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so, laughs> Billy Graham, the Southern Baptist uh, preacher, was also an advisor to presidents. And I'm not saying that I agree completely with the Southern Baptist theology, but I do admire uh, um, Billy Graham and his concern for our nation's leaders. And I just wonder who our nation's leaders are turning to for wisdom and spiritual support. Um, And also, but not only the spiritual support, the, I can say, I'm going to call it the transmission of wisdom from spiritual leader to president to the people. This I think is missing. I don't, I don't pick up on it. Um, They're so embattled. Um, that I don't know if they just have time to espouse any wisdom that they're receiving from others. And I, I think I think this country needs that. It's one thing to say we need to cool down the anger and the rage, which we absolutely need to do that. But it's a whole nother thing for a president or a vice president or a leader to say, I care about everyone in this country not just people in my party, everyone. And I'm trying to figure out from my position in politics how to support all of us living civilly with one another for the betterment of the entire country because we are also part, our country is also part of the world. So to have that bigger view as well. For people that are looking to incorporate that bigger view, I liked how you did the sibling practice. Is there another practice they can do as they're, because I I know a lot of times when we're driving in our cars on the freeway, we kind of forget that we might be related to people. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. When we get tense and angry and frustrated and we have, and we're distracted uh, and we are concerned about our survival, right, it's all about us, right? It's all about us. But I've heard some people say things like, oh, if they see someone cut in front of us uh, to arrive at a theory about why they might be doing that, you know, maybe the person is going to has a medical emergency. I don't know why they did that. Um, But to take a few deep breaths and and uh, commit, recommit to not harming others (laughs) and getting to one's destination without causing any harm. That's the most important thing, if you can remember that. And then there are other things that we do that we forget. But the practice, meditation, mindfulness, compassion, loving kindness, all that is about remembering because we recognize our minds go in a variety of directions and we engage in forgetting. And our commitment is to remember, return to remembering. Well, I, I think that people like you will help make that journey and that path lit for so many people. What thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with? Believe in yourself. Believe in your capacity for loving others beyond what the media says about them. We are in a very precarious situation in the United States. We have media from a variety of perspectives that thrive on defining the other for us. That so-called other may be our neighbor, may be in our family. And we've heard many stories lately about turning against our own relatives, our blood relatives, our neighbors. So we're letting other people define our reality. And I would like to leave us with the the fact that we can define our own reality. 
we can get to know who our rel- our relatives are. We can get to know who our neighbors are. We don't need the media to define that for us because it is it is a distorted definition. So that's what I'd like to leave us with. And that we also have the capacity to adopt one another in our minds and in our hearts. And I hope we will do that. And it could be a, as a simple as a daily practice that we do. Is that something that takes much time daily or is it something we can just kind of set our mind to on a daily practice? Oh, we can set our minds on it throughout the day with just 30 seconds. So it's something we can do. (laughs) Oh, I do it every day. We all can do it. And also, I'm sorry, Mary, Mary, and back back to the uh, doing things with the expectation of an outcome. Try to engage in this practice without an expectation of instant transformation. Oh, I imagine this person as my sibling, but I didn't feel it. That's okay. You tried. Try it again. What encouraging words. You know, so it's a, it's a journey. It's not a race. Exactly. Well, where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work and be part of your community? Mm, I have a website www.pamelaioyatunde.com. And that's the best place to find me. Well, Pamela, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for all that you're doing. Well, thank you, Pamela. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Casting Indra's Net, Fostering Spiritual Kinship and Community. Casting Indra's Net is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support our indie bookstores. You can also purchase this book directly from the publisher at Shambhala at Shambhala.com. We're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. With Breath Hub, you'll experience the transformative power of breath as it harmonizes your body, mind, and spirit. Recommended by experts in fitness, sports, psychology, and medicine. Meet the scientific way of being well. Breath Hub. Breathe better. Live better. Are you a coffee lover who wants to make a difference? Look no further than Fire Department Coffee, a veteran-owned business that gives back to support first responders in need. Each batch of coffee is freshly roasted right here in the USA by a dedicated team of first responders and coffee experts. So when you enjoy a cup of Fire Department Coffee, you're not only drinking high-quality coffee, you're supporting members of your community. Start your day with a coffee that gives back. Visit FireDepartmentCoffee.com. That's Fire, D-E-P-T, Coffee.com. The book Terminal Cancer is a Misdiagnosis, authored by Danny Carroll, is on sale at Amazon now. Licensed psychologist and psychotherapist Tessa Antia John Guerra commented, This is one of the most empowering books on a topic of cancer you will ever read. Award-winning author T.L. Needham commented, This recommended book can be understood by anyone seeking answers, hope, and alternatives to a terminal diagnosis. Buy it now on Amazon.com. Pandemonium. Fast forward 20 years. A U.S. president seizes control of all U.S. missiles, the power grid, the banking system, and every computer in America as he hides in an underground bunker. Pandemonium, a captivating sci-fi thriller where a hidden war, psychics, aliens, artificial intelligence, and transcendental love collide with the latest media technology. Pandemonium, live to all devices. Get your copy on paperback or digital. Free sample at getpsychic.org. Hello, Dr. Cutler here. Do you experience bloating, heartburn, food craving, bowel irregularity, food sensitivities, weight issues? If you do not digest your food, you may be deficient in macronutrients, which your body needs for optimal health. Dr. Ellen Cutler.com teaches that this is an enzyme deficiency. I believe the most important supplement is a full spectrum digestive enzyme. Dr. Ellen's Way Digestive Enzymes 
Hear more about it at drellencutler.com. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.